Hi, I'm Rob Richardson. Welcome to the Docker community. We're going to talk about containerized deployments for your SPA and API. Let's dig in. We'll ask the question, should I deploy in one container or two? One domain or two? Let's dive in. Here's the part where I tell you I'm definitely going to post the slides and the code on my site tonight. <laughs> you may, uh, I've been that person chasing the speaker and it's difficult as well. So you can head off to robrich.org and click on presentations. And here's containerized deployments for your spot and API. Both the slides and the code is up on GitHub. And so we can dig into that together. I look forward to your feedback. What can I do to improve this sample? Containerized deployments for your spot and API. Let's dig into the demo straight away. I have here an empty folder and I want to containerize a web app. Let's go build a web app. I can say make der net app. Here inside this folder, I'll say .NET new uh, web API and give it a, and it will scaffold out a website that um, I can use as my API. This weather forecast API gives me the chance to be able to call into an API and it just randomly generates uh, random weather details. Okay, with that in place, view app, let's create a, um, a view app, view create my app. And this will now interview us, asking us details about how we want to construct our spa. Now that's interesting. We could also use create React app or the Angular CLI to be able to scaffold out a, a client side app. Uh, but I happen to kind of like Vue. Uh, I find the Vue uh, mechanism to be pretty easy to learn and it's fun to dig in. Now this does take a second to spin up this um, CLI. But now it's going to interview us about the features that we want. Do we want TypeScript? That's interesting. Uh, the view router, uh, Flux Store with Vuex. We can have CSS preprocessors to use SAS, uh, linters and formatters. We can include either Mocha with Chai or Jest, and also end to end testing. Cypress is a great choice there. Now, once we've made our selections, we now get asked about all of the particulars of what we want to choose and that works out really well. Now I'm gonna break out of this and let's go into our um, code that we have in GitHub. And let's look at those solutions. Here's that folder, zero CLIs, where we have those two pieces, the view app and the .NET app. Pulling this up in VS Code, we now have those two pieces. Now our goal is to containerize these. So our first step is to create a dot docker ignore and we'll talk about all the things that we don't want in our container the bin folder the obj folder all the content that we build but also all of the user specific settings star.user and the dot vs folder we'll also exclude all the development dependencies like app settings dot development dot json and um, inside properties we have the launch settings.json. That's everything that won't get copied into our container. Now let's build up a Docker file. New file, Docker file, and now we'll do the standard things. From uh, copy, run, CMD. For the from stage, let's head out to Docker Hub, hub.docker.com. We'll search for .NET and go pick the .NET uh, thing. This one actually is a meta container and references all of the other containers, uh, all the other image routes. Okay, so let's go grab this image. And if we scroll down a little bit, we can see that there is a Alpine version of it. So we'll use 5.0 Alpine. Let's set that in place, dash Alpine. Now we need to copy all of our content into place. We'll copy it from the current directory where we'll run the Docker build command to the current directory inside of our image. Where is that directory? Well, let's say work dir, work dir is slash SRC. And now that's our directory. 
now we need to run some commands. If I was on the .NET, if I was running .NET commands from the console, I would say .NET restore to restore all of my libraries. .NET build, I'll build in release mode. .NET test to run all of our tests. Also do that in release mode so we don't accidentally end up with a debug and a release session. And .NET uh, publish. And I will publish to the dist folder. Okay. Now our CMD then will be .NET and uh, net API dot DLL. And that now is in the work der slash dist folder. Now we do need a few environment variables. Let's go grab those. The uh, This tells ASP.NET to start in production mode and listen on all URLs, not just localhost, and also on port 5000. Oh, <laughs> we've got these command line things, but we need to run them as Docker commands. Let's do that. So we'll run this one, and we'll run this one, and we'll run this one, and we'll run this one. There we go. Now this Docker file would work great, but there are a few warts that we can fix up. Right now we have our build tools and our source code in here, and we really don't need that if we're running in production. Back at Docker Hub, we can go look for the um, ASP.NET uh, image, and let's go grab that image. And there is an Alpine variant of it as well. So I'll grab this one, and scrolling down, we can see that there is an Alpine version. We'll use 5.0-Alpine. Okay, so let's split this in half. I'm going to say from Alpine, and we'll do all of the things. We can now switch this to slash app. And now I want to copy my content. I want to copy the dist folder into that current folder. But this would copy it from my local machine here. I don't want to do that. I want to copy from equals build. Well, where is that build stage? Let's name this as build. We've now split our build into two sections. This one is our build server image. And this one is our production runtime server image. This is a multi-stage build, and this allows us to have a really small production deployment image and have all of our build tools in a separate spot. The next thing is that each one of these commands will create a new layer that Docker can cache. Right now, I'm restoring all of my dependencies, and I first copy in all my things. If I need to change a CSS file or an HTML file, some JavaScript, I'm going to re-restore my dependencies. I really want to do this first and then copy all my files second. Now, I still do need to copy in my manifest. So let's copy uh, net api.csproj into the current folder then run the restore, then copy in everything else, and then do all the builds. Now, this optimization allows me to rebuild much faster locally if I'm doing some uh, debugging and adjusting. Now, we could definitely combine these into one command that would um, run all of them together, reducing the number of layers in our build. But because this is now a... Um, a build time image and is not deployed, then having those extra layers doesn't really hurt anything and might make it a little bit easier to debug if, for example, my tests fail but my build succeeds. I can then uh, remote into this layer and continue on. Okay, so we've got our API Docker file. Now let's go create a Docker file for our view app. New file dot Docker file or dot Docker ignore. And again, we'll ignore all of the things that we build, the dist folder, all of the things that we download, node modules, all of the user things, so star.log, um, package lock.json. Now, <laughs> that is somewhat contentious, but I would say let's go download all of the latest things. So I'll specifically exclude package lock.json. And now let's go build our Docker file new file, docker file. 
Now there's a similar uh, node alpine version that we can use. We'll set our work dir to slash src. We will copy in everything into our current folder. And then we will run npm install, run npm build, and that will build out to the dist folder. Now we can flip this as well. Let's actually do that. We'll um, npm install and copy in our package.json into place. So we've done that same optimization. And now let's flip over into our production runtime image. We can say from node Alpine. Wait a minute. This will be static content. So we actually don't need a server for this. We could just use Nginx. That's pretty cool. Now we'll copy all our files from equals build. Let's name this one as build. And we'll copy the um, src dist folder into var lib. Uh, I think it's www. Um, and then we uh, the nginx actually includes a cmd. So we don't need to include that as well. OK, so now we have a Docker file for our API, a Docker file for our web app. And uh, flipping over to those folders where that's already done, we can see that I also created this nginx.conf here in the um, in place. And this nginx.conf will just serve my index.html for anything. If I have client-side routes, maybe I go to my home page or my about page or other pages, I want it to load up my spa if it hits that from the server. Great, so now that we have all of our things, we can fire them up. So when we're doing local debugging, we'll use the Webpack dev server to be able to connect our content between um, our spa and our API. If we're doing containers, then we need to work a different way. So let's go into Docker files for each. I'll go into my net API and let's docker build dash T um, net API step zero and the current folder. Now I've already done this build. Um, I've also built the view app. So if we say docker image list, we can see that we've got that in place. Here's our net API step zero. So let's launch it. Docker run dash P, I'll forward port 5000 to 5000 for net API step zero. And I will run in detached or daemon mode. Okay, so we've got that one run. Let's also Docker run will forward port 3000 to port 80. 3000 was the one that we were debugging on. And run in daemon mode, view app step zero. And now we've got our view app running on port 3000 and our API running on port 5000. So let's head over to localhost 3000 and we'll see that our app loads, but we also have some exception details. Now, the cool thing is that I added this one component into our view app that will go call into our API. It'll go grab the response, loop through each row, turning the date into a, a actual date, and then uh, grab an exception and set that exception message in place as well. We'll use view just to bind these into place so that we can take a look at that. And now we have that connection between our view app and our API. But as we can see, when we loaded this app, we weren't able to call the back end. Let's take a look at that. Where our first request went to localhost 3000, and then our subsequent request also went to localhost 3000 slash API slash weather forecast. Now, if we come here and look at that, it loads our spa again, and that's expected. It's hitting the Nginx um, container, but our API is actually on 5000. If we hit 5000, yep, we've got our API and we're ready to go. So now how do we connect these together? 
Let's docker container rm a7f uh, 452. Now, in development, the Webpack dev server did a great job of sending all of our requests to the API if it needed to. We have this config file here, this um, view config that very specifically says if you've got any requests going to API, send them off to our web server. But in production, we probably need to work a little bit differently. We did that demo of scaffolding and dockerizing the applications, and <laughs> that's often where a lot of Docker 101 talks end. We have two images, two images. You can start them as two containers. Hope it works out. But let's ask the question, which way should we go? One container or two? One domain or two? Should we go to example www.example.com for our spa and api.example.com for our API? What's wonderful is these are not mutually exclusive decisions. We can instead grid them like this. We could run a single domain in two containers. We could run a single domain in one container. We could run subdomains in two containers. We can't run one thing in two places, so we'll just leave this box out. Let's take a look at each of these and see how we would solve it. Let's ask the question, which one should I choose? Well, I'm gonna pivot a little bit and say, when should I choose each one? Why should I choose each one? That's probably a better question to ask. So let's take a look at our first technique, one container, one domain. In this technique, our browser is gonna go through the internet to our SPA and API running in a single container. Now, how do we pull this off? Well, as we're doing this process, we need to go get all of our content into this one container. We're gonna take our API, we're gonna add the details to be able to host public files, and we're gonna build our SPA into that folder. So let's flip back over to our code and take a look at uh, this solution. Close all, shrink, one container, one domain. In our view app, we no longer have our Docker file in our net API, we no longer have our Docker file. Instead, we have one big Docker file that accomplishes both tasks. Here's the .NET container that we already built and that hasn't changed at all. Here's our view container that builds our view app and that hasn't changed either. We have them running simultaneously with BuildKit, that's great. And now we want to copy them into place. Well, this looks a lot like our .NET build uh, our production runtime, but we're actually copying the build content from our build net container. That's the one that we named right here. And we're copying our view content from the view container into app www root. Now that's the folder that our API uses to host static files. We did need to modify our API slightly to use default files and use static files. That allows it to host static files where previously it would only host API requests. We also built one new controller as well, the SPA controller, that's going to answer to all of our client-side routes. Now we could say, listen for everything, <laughs> but in this case, we just enumerated our client-side routes and we're gonna serve our index.html from that file. Okay, so I've already built this container. Let's start it up. docker run-p5000 to 5000. I'll run in daemon mode, spa and API, one container, one domain. And now that we've got that running on port 5000, let's head out back to localhost 5000 and we'll see this work. Now we get our weather forecast, that's perfect. We're hitting our spa and loading this content. We see we've got our HTML loaded from there and when we go to read the weather forecast, we're also going to localhost 5000 slash API weather forecast, and we're getting that JSON response. Perfect. We're able to accomplish the task of hooking our SPA and our API together. Now, on the upside, we got them connected together. On the downside, oh, in development, we're still going to use Webpack dev server for this. But here in production, we have 
that mechanism that easily combines these into one spot. Now on the upside, they both run out of a single container. It's really easy to deploy both sides. On the downside, they run out of one container, so we can't really scale them independently. When would I use this? If I have a monolith that I'm just trying to get into containers, then this might be a good choice. I only need one Heroku or Azure Web App subscription. I don't have a whole lot of microservices, so hosting them all in one place isn't a horrible solution. I might choose this also if I don't have an orchestrator like Kubernetes or Docker Swarm. Next up, let's take a look at two containers, two domains. In this case, the browser is going to reach through the internet to www.example.com for the spa content and then reach out into api.example.com for the spa content or for the API content. Now to accomplish this, we do need to add cores headers. <laughs> And cores is kind of a difficult task. As the browser goes to do an API request, either an AJAX request or a fetch request, the browser is going to stop and make an options request to that same URL to see if it gets that access control allow origin header and if it matches the current domain. If it does, it will then continue with the normal request. So now we need in the API that URL to the spa and we need in the spa, the API to the URL, or the URL to the API. We need to be able to cross link those. So let's take a look at the Docker files that we'll build here. Now in two containers, one, two domains, we have our backend app. Here in the Docker file, we did choose to embed this as an environment variable. So now we can change this as we move this between different environments but we did need to tweak out our application to add all the logic of processing this course header. It's gonna read it from this environment variable and be able to use it to fill out that server. Now that's perfect for the server end of things. For the client side application of things, it becomes a little bit more difficult. Now here, this looks like exactly the same Docker file that we had. We can't really inject environment variables in here because, well, the environment variables will run here in the browser, not on the SPA server. So we need to do these at build time, not at runtime. You. <laughs> okay, so we've got this environment variable. Um, I have this environment variable file, and view requires that environment variables that get baked into the built content start with view app. So here's this view app base URL in our component, rather than just saying slash API slash weather forecast, we actually have to prefix it with view app base URL. Okay, now the bummer part here is because we're baking this environment variable in at build time, the client side spa container isn't portable between the various environments. Yeah, <laughs> that's a real big downside. Okay, so I've already built these containers and let's run both of them. I will run the docker container rm5be so we don't get a port conflict. Let's run the backend API. Let's also run the front end spa and I'm mapping it from port 3000 into port 80 where nginx is running. So now let's go back to localhost 3000. Localhost 3000. Now what we see here is that our first request went correctly to localhost 3000, that's great. And our second request went to localhost 5000. Now, the interesting thing is that here in this header, we have this access control allow origin header. And so because that access control allow origin header has port 3000, then the browser knows that it can continue with this request and away it goes. So that's great. We were able to load our application correctly and we're able to reach the other domain once we've configured these environment variables. Now that is a little bit intense. We had to configure all the environment variables, our application, our container is no longer portable between the various environments, but we can scale these containers differently now. We can have more uh, instances of our API and less instances of our spa if that's the way our traffic runs. That's perfect. So when would I use this technique? 
if my teams are very separate between um, the front end and the back end, and they only agree on the API, but they evolve very separately, the teams work very differently, then this might be a good choice. Next up, let's take a look at two containers, one domain. Now, what's interesting about this approach is the browser is going to reach through the internet to a reverse proxy. The reverse proxy will look at the URL. Does it contain slash API? If so, it'll send it off to the API container. And if not, it'll send it off to the spa container. Now that's perfect. From the browser's perspective, it's just reaching one website, but I still have two different containers so that I can scale differently. How do we accomplish this? With a Kubernetes ingress controller. A Kubernetes ingress controller is a great way to do that reverse proxy and take a look at the path and be able to forward either to the API container or to the SPA container. That's great. In development, we're still doing this with our Webpack dev server, but that's kind of exactly what the Webpack dev server is doing. Based on our configuration, if it contains API, it's forwarding off to the API, and if it doesn't, it's forwarding it directly to Vue to be able to render that content. That's really cool. Now, the Webpack dev server is hosting Vue at the same time, so it's both the reverse proxy and the service, and yeah, that's a little weird. So let's take a look at the Docker file that accomplishes this. Here is our two containers, one domain solution. Uh, two containers, two domain solution, rather. Nope. Two containers, one domain solution. Our .NET app here in startup, we don't have any weird cores content going on. Um, our Docker file looks very standard. We don't have any environment variable we need to inject. In our front end app, same thing. Our Docker file is built straight away and our component doesn't have any of that complexity of trying to resolve where is the other URL. The magic happens here in our Kubernetes files. We have a deployment for our backend API that specifies the number of containers we're gonna use. Here's that container image that we've got. We also have a service that will round robin across all of those pods, all of those containers. And for our front end spa, we also have a deployment in this case, we're specifying two pods and a service that will round robin in front of both of those pods. Here's the magic. We then have a Kubernetes ingress controller. Now, in this case, I'm debugging locally, so I won't have a host entry in here. And I've also chosen to disable SSL. But if I was going to do this in production, I would add a host so that I could resolve DNS at the ingress controller. The magic happens here. I'm matching this path. Does the path start with slash API slash? If so, go to the API. If not, go to the SPA app. Okay, so let's say Docker container RM. Let's remove the previous experiment. ADA Docker container RM 010. And let's come in here. Here's that KDS folder, and I can say kubectl apply dash F KADS. Now the beauty here is that it will enumerate all of the files inside that KADS folder and run each one. Uh, cube CTL get all. If I hurry, I can see them starting. Nope, <laughs> they're already running. So here's my two front end pods, my one back end pod, the two services that round robin across them, and cube CTL get all and ingress. Let's take a look at our ingress controller. And so now if I come back here to localhost port 80, I can see that I first hit my ingress controller and that will forward on to the correct container. When I hit localhost, I load my spa app from my spa container. And when I do this weather forecast, I'm also just hitting localhost, no cores headers or any other information there and it's able to get that JSON response. Perfect, we were able to load all of this because we have this Kubernetes ingress controller making the decisions about which container it should route to. So that's really helpful. We can now scale our pods independently. We can run more containers for the services that need it and less containers for the services that can run more leanly. We don't have any complexity of course headers or images that need to be hard-coded to certain environments. 
On the downside, we need that Kubernetes orchestrator to be able to accomplish this. If we're running in an environment that doesn't have an orchestrator, then this may not be a great solution. I would choose this when I have a Kubernetes cluster available to me and when the SPA can reach out to one API or maybe an API gateway that can grab all of the traffic and proxy it through to one URL. So, <coughs> pardon me. So that's really helpful. Then the magic question, which, which solution is the best? Well, it depends. It depends a lot on what you need. If we take a look at these three solutions that we looked at, when we had one container for a single domain, this was perfect if we had a few microservices, maybe a monolith, and we had one shared hosting account. We pack both the API and the SPA into place, and we run the SPA out of the API's public folder. If I'm deploying my monolith, this might be a great solution. We also looked at two containers on subdomains. We saw the difficulty of doing base URLs and cores, headers, and all of the environment variables associated with this. We saw how matching those two was a little bit awkward. Now this is perfect if we have very separate teams for front end and back end, and we're just matching them based on a naming convention. Two containers on a single domain. This is great if I have a Kubernetes environment. If I've started to sprawl out into lots of microservices, a Kubernetes ingress can start to harvest those and group them into similar URLs. This is perfect when I have many microservices and when I need to run them all from a single URL. I can now scale my pieces separately and I can keep the, all of those, the complexity of um, course headers and embedded URLs, um, embedded environment variables out of my build. Now this has been a lot of fun. You can reach me on Twitter at Rob underscore Rich and you can grab the code and slides at robrich.org. Thanks for letting me present today at the Docker community.